Are you a true believer in the raw file? Are you a true believer in the JPEG? Is that the only way to go because the camera knows best to give you the best results? Whichever camp you're in, I think you're going to find this video interesting. Hot and ready versus do some editing, some tweaking, know your formulas and make it good. Does it matter? Let's look. Like I do on a lot of things, I'm going to put the conclusion up front and you probably already know what it is. Yes. You get way more by using a raw file. And this counts if you're in a high dynamic range scene where you have deep darks and bright sunlit backlighting through the trees. But it also applies with a portrait because when you have all the data, when you have more information to work with, it gives you less opportunity to create banding in skies, to create artifacting in skin tones and shadows. And in most working situations, Absolutely. And when I saw this file and had the side by side and looked at them, I said, no, it's time to start recording. I'm shooting a portrait session with the Sony, with the XT series, something like that. I'm, I'm going pure raw. But when I'm shooting the streets, I do shoot raw plus a medium JPEG. So that if I want to quickly transfer to a phone or upload to Instagram or make an Instax print or something like that, it's right there. This is the X100V. So this is Fuji's latest or almost latest version of their crop sensor, and it rivals any other crop sensor on the market. Some people would say it rivals full frame sensors, although in low light, I think you do get a little more from a full frame Sony or something like that. Fuji has some of the best in-camera JPEGs, but of course I always shoot raw because I want to be able to edit. I want to be able to apply presets. I want to be able to have the full quality. Even though this applies whatever camera you're shooting, if you're a Fuji shooter, you're probably in the camp or have certainly thought about being in the camp of, oh, I should just use those in-camera profiles like Velvia, like Classic Negative, like all of these tools, right? Because unlike a lot of the cameras where their in-camera JPEG profiles are atrocious, Fuji actually has some pretty appealing film-like in-camera profiles. And so people sometimes actually buy these cameras for the profiles, which I think is a little bit silly and I'm going to show you why. Even though if I come over here and I look at a photo in Lightroom, for example, and let's go to the develop module in Capture One, as well as in Lightroom now, you can actually change the profile. You can go to the profiles and you can select those native semi-native, right? This is on a raw file. So you can actually apply the camera profile even on Fuji to these files and that's great. I have found, and we'll look at that in another video, that these profiles don't actually come out the same at all, especially in Lightroom as they do when you're shooting the same profile in camera, even though presumably there's a collaboration with Fuji. And let's not waste time, let's get in here and I'm gonna show you and you can make your decision on what file format you should be shooting. This was taken at sunset on the X100V and its crop sensor. Neat scene on the lake, birds flying, sun setting. And this is straight out of camera with the Velvia profile, I believe we were using, and the dynamic, uh, dynamic range in auto mode. So basically it's the default Velvia setting that comes in a Fuji camera. Let's look at the same in a raw file. Here's the raw out of camera. Now, at a glance, wow, look at that. Look at that profile. Look at how much Fuji did to that. At a glance, it looks great. And it's like, it handled it really well. Let's just shoot those JPEGs and upload them and not waste all our time with all these presets and developments and Photoshops and all that kind of stuff because the camera's doing it for us, right? Well, maybe not. Let's come back and look again beyond the glance. This is a scene with a lot of high dynamic range, a lot of dynamic range, rather. Uh, and the image, the resulting image, has a fairly good dynamic range. But you notice it's really crushing these blacks. We have a high quality JPEG. I can still lift quite a bit out of these shadows, right? There's actually a lot of information. So it's not truly clipping in those shadows. Here's the problem here is how it handled the highlights. Now this, this is bad. This is banding. And the truth is, straight out of camera, we have banding on this around the sunlight, okay? And that's what concerns me. Let's edit this to a similar level of dynamic range on the raw file and then compare side by side. And so I don't make this long. I'm going to focus on this file. And this is kind of a landscape representation where we're dealing with a high contrast situation. But even if you're not, I want you to mark 
how much control you have by maintaining your raw file. So obviously on the right, we have the JPEG and on the left, we have our raw, which at the moment looks really clipped. I'm gonna go down and I could manually tweak this. You can see if I lift shadows, there's quite a bit of information. If I drop highlights, there's quite a bit of information. Obviously this is that kind of that flat, muddy, nasty, ugly HDR. So I could go to something like natural HDR presets because as you know, I always start with a formula. It saves you so much time to start with good formulas, whether you get formulas like I create or whether you are making your own formulas and saving them, having the right formula to start with is key because otherwise you will not try all the variables that you could try. But what I'm actually gonna do here is kind of try to get a little bit close, that kind of Fuji filmic look. So I'm gonna go to a Provia 400. Now you can see, oh, I'm really crushing those blacks. But then I'm gonna go up to the mod presets, the chem mod presets of Filmist, and this is Filmist version 1.5 that has these tonal range mods that are actually really powerful. And I'm gonna bring this in and put the tonal range bath B on this. Okay, now let's see what we've done. I'm not trying to match this exact color for color. I'm just trying to get a good process on both of these and see what we can get out of this file. All right, here is our JPEG again. And here's where we're at now with our raw. So suddenly, obviously the color's a little bit different, but man, the gradients, we're getting pretty clean gradients in that sky. But you can see, when you turn the exposure way down, this is often a way that I will test to see if I've truly clipped or not, is I'll just drag that exposure way too far. If you do that and you still have this kind of gray black super banding right here, like where it's not, it's a mess, that's because you've truly clipped. You filled up those pixel buckets and they're truly clipped. I can go and just use a brush, right? You can see the masks that my tonal range bath put on there automatically. And I'm just going to paint a little bit on round here and just kind of bring that highlight down just a little bit. I can't do too much because I'll get this banding around here if I'm not super, super gentle. So I'm gonna go like this and make it a little more tense right here on the sun and just play with this a little bit, but not too much. I don't want more sky banding in this. I'm gonna apply a little bit of grain and denoise using the low ISO filmic preset in Filmist. And of course, bear in mind, all this stuff could be done manually. Remember, I've just applied a color profile, but essentially what I'm doing here is applying a color profile and then playing with those shadows and highlights over here. And I'm gonna pull down my highlights even a little bit more. There's nothing here that you couldn't do manually, it just was quicker for having the formula. So I'm gonna turn up my shadows and highlights even a little bit more, especially the highlights. I don't mind having some, some deep shadow here, but I'm gonna pull my shadows up a touch and my blacks back up a touch. So you can see we're here, and let's look again side by side at the two of these. So at a glance, that JPEG looked great, but look how much more banding we have on this one, on our JPEG on the right versus on the left, we have still some clipping, but a lot more subtle gradients. Okay, so what else? What else can we do with it? Let's actually take this, now that we've edited our raw, and you know I always say this is why I, I use tools on the raw file as much as possible. I try to do my dynamic range, my tonal edits from the raw file, because we have the most from that file, or from whatever my original file is. If it was a JPEG, I'm gonna take as much as possible from that original file. But the power of the sensor in this, you're losing a lot of it with the JPEG. In fact, I wanna show you something right here that I thought was pretty amazing. We're not gonna edit these today, but look at this. This is a JPEG, again, Velvia, of Sandra sitting in the car, all right? It looks very nice and out of camera. It's almost like you took it with a cell phone, right? Because it's so good out of camera and that's why people love these. They're like, oh, this is so much better. I can just upload. So that's why when I'm doing street and casual stuff, I'm shooting the JPEG side by side, but then when I go to copy them, I don't usually save the JPEGs except for sometimes a few reference images for tests like this because the JPEGs are for quick use. Look at the raw versus the JPEG. Now this hasn't been edited yet. I could edit this to get it like this. Look at how much less clarity. They are really clank cranking down the clarity on these in-camera profiles, which may to some degree be kind of filmic. Here's another one. Look at how much dynamic range manipulation, almost like we did a bracketed HDR, and how much clarity has been reduced on this. Here's the raw that I edited in a similar way, and I had to pull down that clarity by 40 points. If I, if I re restore my clarity to normal, look at the difference between the Fuji JPEG here and 
the raw version. Let's get back on topic. I don't want to go too long. We're going to take our raw version that we edited and I'm just going to control or command E. I'm going to bump that right over into Photoshop so I can do a little bit more because I'm going to show you how to get rid of that final bit of banding in the sun very quickly. And I could use Lumist or Alchemist or I could manually. We're going to do some manual stuff too and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you both. What I would first do if I wanted to bring some restoration to this, and it looks pretty good, but you can see we still have kind of some banding, some clipping on that sunlight, and that's what I want to get rid of. I'm just going to run the dynamic declip from Alchemist, which is just a combination of controls and effects. And you can see it running, building the layers down here, just making my life a little easier. All right, let's see what that did. That brought a lot more dynamic range. I'm not even going to use all that. I'm going to click the main group. You can see it put all those in the group from Alchemist and I'm going to drop it down. Now again, this kind of took the shadows, the lows, the highs, it mixed them up and then it put it a little bit of highlight clip painting. And I'm going to show you what that means because we're going to do a little bit more highlight clip painting. So you can see here, it's trying to kind of balance out those highlights and shadows and make them look good. But I still have some clipping. So let me show you a manual trick here. It doesn't need any actions or anything. And we're just going to put a layer and we're going to go here and make a new layer with a little plus icon in the layers panel and it's putting it inside the group. I want it at the very top. So I'm going to drag this up right here so it's on top of everything. And I'm going to call it Pixel Paint. This is something I teach in a lot of workshops. People think, oh no, I can't paint. I can't do anything manual. Yes. Yes, you can. It's very easy. And I'm going to show you how right now. And it's also something I cover in my more advanced Photoshop and retouching workshops. All you're going to do with a Pixel Paint is you've made a transparent layer here. Press B to take the brush tool. I'm going to make it soft, so I'm holding Alt to kind of mess with the size and make it really soft. I don't want any hardness on this. And you can see my opacity up here is very low at 16%. What I'm going to do is just start painting this. Now, if I had this at 100%, what would happen? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sample. I'm going to press Alt to bring up the eyedropper, and I'm going to sample the area right here around it. So I kind of get that creamy, correct mix. Obviously, this doesn't work. I could paint. And I could go to color overlay or something like that. And that actually doesn't work too bad, but it looks a little bit artificial. Let's undo those. What I'm going to do in this case is turn my opacity very low, like about 10, 15%. And I'm just going to do a few brush strokes right along here to get rid of that banding just like that. So we kind of have this natural, natural feel. Make my brush bigger. Don't go too small on these brushes. I'm trying to bring the feathering of the sky kind of in here so we're not don't feel like there's banding. I'm breaking up that banding. You can see how I'm frequently eye dropping and then clicking again. Now look what's happened. We just did that in about 30 seconds. Okay. Now that's a lot. We could switch to a blending mode like overlay, like color, like luminosity, but I'm going to leave this normal and just go down here and I'm going to turn the opacity down on this just a little bit so that we're not losing too much detail and we're keeping some of that natural. I'm going to put it right at about 50%. Here's this. See what we did there? Now, and we could go further, right? You still see a tiny bit of banding right here around kind of a transition between the right, the white, and the orange. So I could paint in a little more there with some of these darker tones to kind of blend it together. But you, you, you want it to feel like the sun is still kind of shining through these trees, right? So you're kind of going like this, and we're cheating a little bit. Obviously, the more you can get in camera, the better. But look what we did. We just softened down that sky just like that, even though that raw file looked, excuse me, that JPEG file looked great out of camera. And it's like, wow, it's amazing. But when we took that raw file, which at a glance you look at and you're like, oh, the JPEG is way better. But guess what? A quick edit with just a few formulas, a few presets, a few manipulations of the shadow, the highlight, the clarity sliders gives us control over that raw file with a lot less banding because the problem is with the JPEG is what we have with the JPEG, we can't get any more, right? We can't go back if we only take the JPEG and say, no, I want to reprocess this. The camera already threw away three quarters, a third of the, two thirds of the information that was in the raw file in order to say, no, I think this looks good. The software decided it saved it. It threw away the rest and saved a JPEG. If you only shoot JPEG, you're throwing away two thirds to three quarters of your information. And we edited it in Lightroom. Then we took to Photoshop and just spent a couple minutes enhancing it just a little bit to improve that sun a little. And let's look at what we have on the screen. On the right now is our JPEG. And on the left 
is what we got out of that raw file in just a few minutes. The difference here is staggering. And while the JPEG at a glance looked good, there really is no comparison, even if we hadn't gone into Photoshop. But the point is, yes, you can paint and do those little details if you need to, to bring out that final little bit. Don't sit there and fight with highlight and shadow and whites forever when you have something that's truly clipped. Just go in and do a little manual retouching and you're gonna find that it works good. So we had our JPEG, then we had our raw edit, and then we had our final edit that we enhanced a little bit out of Photoshop. And that's why I'll always do the raw capture alongside of the JPEG, most of the time just the raw capture. But if I have a benefit, if I like the JPEG, if I want that opportunity to quickly upload or print it, the JPEGs in camera, and the Fuji especially, but I think they're all getting better at this, are coming out really good. But don't think for a moment that that means that that JPEG is equal to what you can do with a raw. And I think this was a great example of it. Those profiles that your camera gives you, those are nothing you can't do in post in Capture One and Lightroom and Photoshop and in other tools, I think the answer here is actually very clear, except in specific situations where you're doing a production workflow that demands or that only needs JPEGs and you're not coming back, you're not doing editing, that RAWs are absolutely better. Sure, they're larger by about three, four times, but it's not large like shooting raw video or something like that, and it gives you an immense amount of control. Could we have pulled more information out of that JPEG? Yes, we could have tinkered with it, but without just manually doing a lot more painting than we had to do on the raw, we could not have brought back that clip, that banding. We would have had to try to fix all of that because it was already part of the JPEG file. It was baked in by the camera, and on the raw, we had all that raw data from the sensor. So it doesn't matter if you're shooting an X100V like this or a full frame Sony or a Hasselblad, that more data gives you more control. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you'll click that like, that subscribe button. And if you guys want some of the presets that I was using and tools, I will put a link to the free pack of Filmus because that's what I was editing with in the Lightroom side. And all the other tools I was working with are also on my site at simfx.com. But I'll put a link to where you can go check out Filmus and there is a free edition of that where you can play around with some of these formulas and film looks and kind of get that natural rich color as well. Hope you guys enjoy this and we'll see you on the next one.